Why did only one in every five members of Flak Crew survive World War II? How did the anti-aircraft cannon become the most feared tank killer? How did it down hundreds of Allied bombers? And why was its fire control system disturbingly ahead of its time when it first appeared? You're going to hear all that and more through the intense story of the infamous 88. Let's begin. In the early 1930s, Germany was rearming with increasing speed, despite the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles specifically banning development of tanks, aircraft, artillery, and other weapons. But behind the scenes, under many cover-up operations, Germans were doing exactly that. World War I had made it clear that aircraft in military operations were there to stay. By the 1930s, air power was evolving fast, and the threat was no longer just reconnaissance planes or dogfighters. New strategic bombers showed potential of flying at altitudes that put them out of reach of small arms and low-caliber anti-aircraft fire, while at the same time carrying payloads powerful enough to flatten entire city blocks. So, Germans were thinking ahead, and they wanted something new to protect themselves from this threat. Krupp's engineers were tasked with developing a new high-velocity cannon with quite substantial requirements. Through many errors and trials, they came up with what would very soon become known as the 8.8cm Flak 18. Now, Flak is short for, in German, Flugzeugabwehrkanon, literally meaning anti-aircraft gun. But the Flak would catch on and become a term of its own. Even today, you can hear people say, I got a lot of Flak for doing or saying that, referring to heavy anti-aircraft fire that had such an impact on Allied airmen. However, going back to the cannon, it was built to fire high-velocity, time-fused shells, set to detonate at a specific altitude and shower the bombers with deadly metal fragments. A direct hit could easily obliterate any aircraft of the time, while near misses were enough to shred wings, engines, or the cockpit and cause the plane more than enough trouble to stay airborne. It was very accurate, it was powerful, and it could be rotated or elevated quickly in all directions to track fast-moving targets thanks to its advanced cruciform carriage. It could elevate from minus 3 to 85 degrees, which came in handy for attacking ground targets as well, and that unexpectedly soon gave it a new role, but we'll come to that in a second. It weighed about 7 tons, had a team of 10 men, and was designed to be towed by truck or half-truck, giving it the mobility needed for the Blitzkrieg tactics Germany envisioned. A well-trained crew could fully emplace the gun in just about two and a half minutes, or even fire while still on its wheels in an emergency. The dark thing is that as the war progressed and turned against Germany, flat crews were increasingly old men, wounded soldiers, young boys, and even women, especially in communication and radar roles. Over 1.2 million people were serving in the anti-aircraft defense arm of the Luftwaffe, which was almost half of the entire force. But before going into that, what is actually ingenious with this cannon, much like with many other German pieces of equipment of the time, is that everything around it was designed to give it maximum effectiveness in combat. They didn't know it at the time, but they had just created arguably the best gun of the Second World War. It didn't take long for it to see combat. A few units were sent with the German Expeditionary Force in the Spanish Civil War for combat testing. The results were enough to get the attention of high command, and very soon the 88 was deemed the best anti-aircraft weapon available. But no one fully realized just what they had in their hands yet, and how it would take on many roles never envisioned for it. You never know what you might come upon on the battlefield, and so the 88s in the Spanish Civil War were used for anti-anything when needed. It immediately proved it could, besides downing planes, also blast bunkers, infantry positions, and most interestingly, tanks. Tanks of the time had barely enough armor to stop small arms fire, so a direct hit by a high-velocity anti-aircraft gun was going to ruin their day anyway. However, this would soon change completely when the new global conflict erupted a couple of years later. And besides time-fused and direct-hit shells, 88s got the armor-piercing version as well. It is now 1939, and Germany went into World War II with just over 2,600 flak guns. Now, that is twice as many as Britain had at the time, while America almost hadn't any at all. Germany's prediction for the need for such a gun would surely prove correct very soon, and they would produce about 21,000 units of different versions of 88s throughout the war, but their crews would pay a steep price for manning such a weapon. By this time, they were further refining them, with Flak 36 introducing a multi-section barrel, easier to replace when worn, a new cruciform carriage called Lafette 36 that sped up emplacement, a steel shield for the crew to protect them against enemy fire and shrapnel, and other smaller ergonomic improvements. The barrel was made longer, and a shell with a longer propellant case was introduced that gave it even crazier muzzle velocity. The Flak 37 followed with even better targeting instruments, and most importantly, the data transmission system that allowed the gun to receive targeting information from a central fire control unit. They also had a direct view site for ground targets, but this highly sophisticated fire control system gave the 88s that notorious effectiveness in the anti-aircraft role. This was a mechanical analog computer that, coupled with rangefinders, acoustic devices, and later radars, would automatically calculate and feed data for aiming to all guns in the battery which were connected to it. A central command crew would track targets, determine their speed and altitude, and aim multiple 88s at the predicted interception point. 
They had to make calculations based on several parameters, then aim the guns at the point in their predicted path. So by the time planes would be at that point, the shells would meet them and time fuse to explode right around them. You see, depending on the altitude, shells sometimes needed even over 20 seconds to arrive at the height where they needed to explode. So making all those calculations in such a short time is impressive. Unlike the Allies, who developed time proximity fuses that changed anti-aircraft effectiveness completely and kept them as a closely guarded secret throughout the war, Germans never managed to build and field effective proximity fuses. So, they stuck with time fuses throughout the war, which had lower effectiveness, as the shells would often explode too short or overshoot and explode too late. Still, the sheer volume of fire a single battery could put out guaranteed that some planes were not returning home. This went lower as the war progressed and Allies began deploying countermeasures for radar and electronic jammers, so the effectiveness dropped from, on average, 4,000 shells fired to down a single bomber, to 16,000 shells per kill. But don't let that fool you, because through the entire war, flak was an unavoidable and extremely feared weapon that downed hundreds of Allied planes, killed thousands of crewmen, or made them bail out and then get captured over German-held territory. But this went both ways, as Allies knew this, and targeted flak batteries in every conceivable way. 88 had a high muzzle velocity of around 2,700 feet per second and an effective vertical range of 26,000 feet, which was more than enough to reach most Allied bombers. It had a flat trajectory and excellent accuracy at long range for ground targets as well. It also had a very high rate of fire, up to 20 rounds per minute, thanks to its semi-automatic sliding block breach. After firing, it recoiled and ejected the spent casing automatically. When the loader inserted a new round, it could be set to fire automatically upon insertion. The 88mm shell weighed just under 10 kilos. Inside was around 1 kilo of explosive and a steel casing designed to fragment into deadly shrapnel upon explosion. Those black puffs you'd see in the sky were from the explosive filler. Now imagine, around each of those puffs, about 10,000 fragments spraying out at high speed in a 10 to 15 meter lethal radius. Bombers were aluminum skinned, with armor only around critical components, so the crew was almost not protected from the flak, as well as the fuel tanks, engines, hydraulic lines, and so on. Later introduced heavier flat guns like the 10.5 and 12.8 cm had huge 15 and 26 kilo shells, with double and even triple the explosive filler. They were much more scarce than the 88s, but they were devastating in the skies. But now you may wonder, how did this anti-aircraft cannon become literally an anti-tank sniper? Well, at the very start of the war, Germans established complete air superiority over Europe, so anti-aircraft batteries didn't have much work to do. There were a few rare encounters with heavy Allied armor, like the French Char B1 or British Matilda II, that 37 and even 50mm guns, which were at the time the main anti-tank weapons, couldn't even scratch. So in those instances, 88s were called in to dismantle them. And they did. However, Erwin Rommel would prove just how effective 88s could be against armor. It was during the Battle of Arras in North Africa when the British launched a surprise armoured counterattack against Rommel's 7th Panzer Division. His light panzers were pushed back and the whole position was at risk of being overrun. So, Rommel ordered all available guns to lower their barrels and fire at the advancing British tanks. They just decimated them, and Germans now began actually thinking of giving more opportunity to 88s to fight armour, as they were surprisingly very good at it. High muzzle velocity, great accuracy and flat trajectory, coupled with good optics, was just the perfect combination for open desert warfare. But it would also come in handy very soon on the Eastern Front as well. Germans soon got special armour-piercing rounds, like Panzer Granite 39 and 40, with explosive filler to cause internal explosions when the armour was penetrated. They could go through about 100 millimeters of armor at 2 kilometers, which is more than enough to endanger any tank the Allies had at the time. Then, Germans got their rude awakening when faced with the heavy Soviet armor that their anti-tank weapons struggled with. 88s were again called to help. For a brief time early in the war, they were almost the only means Germans had to knock out Soviet armor. So seeing this effectiveness, but also realizing the vulnerability of their crews, that very soon became a prime target for everyone, from fighter aircraft and bombers to tanks, snipers and infantry, they understood they would need more protection and mobility to use the firepower they had effectively and not die in the process. This way, basically, the flak became PAK, meaning Panzerabwehrkanone, or anti-tank cannon. This was now a redesigned 88 that would be put on the Tiger I and enter service in late 1942. If you know anything about World War II history, you have surely heard of the Tiger's 88 and how much it was feared by all Allied tankers. Then, there were the tank destroyers like Nashorn and Elephant that used a further improved and more powerful version, the Pac-43. These vehicles had their reliability issues, but the guns they carried were always described by both sides as the best anti-tank guns of the war. They were paired with superior optics and could destroy any tank the Allies had, at ranges where they could only dream of returning fire. It didn't help Germany win the war due to many other factors of the time, but it surely wreaked havoc on Allied tank columns in dozens of recorded instances. 
Now, as 1943 was rolling around, the tide of the war in the air had turned decisively against Germany. Allies were now sustaining a 24-hour bombing campaign, targeting the most valuable German industrial facilities, but also hitting, either accidentally or on purpose, civilian targets as well. Flak crews had to be constantly alert and ready to defend their skies, and they were positioned around the most valuable targets to defend them, so logically, their risk of being hit was only greater. Allied bombers began dropping flak suppression bombs, which were a sort of time-fused cluster bomb designed to explode over suspected gun positions and shred them. Flak batteries were also attacked by fighter bombers in strafing runs, and their casualty rates skyrocketed by the second phase of the war to between 50 and 70 percent, with that number being even higher in the final desperate months. Because the war was changing and moving rapidly, most flak batteries were usually either hastily dug in or positioned in the open. But sometimes, however, they were set in concrete emplacements for better protection. And talking about those emplacements, we have to mention flak towers. These were massive, complex, fortified anti-aircraft gun platforms. They would act as anti-aircraft systems, of course, but also as air raid shelters for thousands of civilian refugees. They were some sort of fortress and anti-aircraft battery built into one self-sustaining fortress-like structure. These things are completely overlooked in history, but they were some of the most heavily fortified and technologically advanced defensive structures built by Germany during the war. There were eight major flak tower complexes around three major cities, Berlin, Hamburg, and Vienna. Each tower was built of reinforced concrete walls, thick around three meters, able to withstand direct hits from 500 kilogram bombs. They had multiple floors with ammunition storage, hospitals, supplies, and shelter areas. They also had heavier versions of flak guns, like four twin-mounted 12.8cm cannons, supported by 88s, and then 37 and 20mm automatic cannons for defense against low-flying fighter bombers. Although these towers were quite impressive and had extreme firepower, they couldn't provide much of a defense to German airspace, as there were simply too few of them, and allies would avoid and try to go around them. As the war came to an end, these flak towers became last stand fortresses and some of the last positions to fall. Today, some of them have even been transformed into museums you can visit.